it's um, going to, good morning guys, online we are still in Nehemiah, in my notes it simply says Nehemiah chapter 4, um, but we'll see in a moment that it's quite an interesting, or actually it's week 4, it's chapter 3 and 4 and so on, it's woven in together, it's, it's wonderful. I would like you to just for a moment think, you don't have to say it out loud, this is not all that charismatic, so you don't have to say it out loud or chant it, but you can think it. This morning, I can, I have the opportunity to change my thinking. I have the opportunity to change my attitude. And with that, I have the possibility of changing my life. Or you could have dialed out, as some did. All right, last week, we saw how the people of Jerusalem responded to Nehemiah. And um, in Nehemiah 2, verse 18, the second half, it says the following. So they began this good work. So they began this good work. The people of Jerusalem started rebuilding the walls. It all started with Nehemiah painting a picture of what could be to the exiles. Those have, that have returned from Babylon have returned to the broken down city that have become used to living in the rubble. He started painting a, a picture of what could be. He started moving them again to dream, not only to remember, but to dream of the future, not simply to remember what was the great Jerusalem and kind of weep as they go along, because they went way beyond that. As time passed, they forgot. They didn't even weep anymore. It was just navigating the rubble. And so he painted a new picture of getting them to dream again, getting them to move beyond what they had settled for, of how life could become, of how they could change, of what the future could look like. And so he moved them to dream again, to believe, to step out, to step up, to take ownership. And so a scattered remnant could become a united nation again. The stirring of God through Nehemiah, taking a scattered remnant, getting them to dream again, and bringing them together as a united nation. Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 1 says, Eliashev, the high priest, the high priest, the high priest and his fellow priest went to work and started to rebuild the sheep gate. I just love the fact that the building is now starting. So we, we've had all the introductions. We've had chapter one. We've had chapter two. Chapter three, verse one, the high priest and his fellow priest started to rebuild the sheep gate. I love it that it starts with them with the high priest and the, his priests, the, the priests under him, that they would lead the nation. Not only in, in rituals, not, not only in, uh, in the religion of the day, but leading by example. It obviously, I'm sure if it did the same for you, but it obviously stirs you and reminds you of what happened when they crossed the Jordan. When this same nation, well, couple of generations prior, when this same nation entered into their promised land, the land of promise, that which God had for them, it said that the Ark of the Covenant, the priests carried the Ark of the Covenant into the river, into this raging, gushing, frothing, flooding river. And as they entered the river, it ran downstream. And it built up on the left-hand side. I think it's in, the, in this context that it says, and it, it flooded up, it built up all the way to a place called Adam. You can check it later. It's not relevant. But as the priest stood in the water, the nation could follow. A nation following in behind them. You know, this for me is reality Christianity. When, when the leadership... It's not simply dishing out aloof theology, food for thought. Wonderful when, when I preach my gut out and somebody says to me, that was food for thought. <laughs> no, it's not. Go and do it. 
and why I say that is when, when the leadership actually gets stuck in, in the real world, in a real way, when the leaders are real, because Jesus was real. Acts chapter 1, Luke writes, he says, in my former book, Dear Theophilus, I began to write all that Jesus began to do and say. He was a doer, to do and to say. This Jesus of Nazareth. And so as a priesthood of all believers and as a leadership, we are called to exactly that, to reality Christianity, to a visible outworking of the inworking of the Holy Spirit within us. That was the first aspect. I'm going to make probably five or seven points that I'm not sure. The first one is the leaders lead. The leaders led the way. It started off with a high priest and the priest following. The second part is who followed? Second question is who followed? Who actually rolled up their sleeves and followed into and started rebuilding? Um, I trust you've read the, um, the, the chapter, chapter three. Because in, in some regard, when, the, when we read it the first time, it's kind of se- semi-boring. It's almost like a genealogy. Um, because it's this one building next to that one, in any event. But when we get into it, it's really exciting and really interesting. So I'm not going to read it for you again. I've asked uh, a number of times that you would read it. I've asked through the leaders. I've asked through the live groups. So if you haven't read it, you've been obedient, disobedient. I'm going to move on. The first part is, it says, the first lot that, that joined in, the first part that actually, uh, first group that started rebuilding, is the men of Jericho. I find that semi-hilarious. Remember, in, during the time of worship, Tim said, it is God who brings ruin or reward. Can you remember that? He said, God brings ruin or reward. Okay, what is Jericho known for? Jericho known, is known for being a fortified city, having this incredible wall. And Israel walking around it and causing it, God causing it to collapse. And so the very people that lost their wall to God is now rebuilding God's wall, the wall of Jerusalem. The first group mentioned, I, I just thought it's very ironic, and uh, let's move on. And so the other guys that, that were mentioned, uh, the goldsmiths, the perfume makers, the residents, in other words, the yellow amal for us, the whole lot, and the merchants, those that actually went to and fro, uh, that's what merchants do. Smosa, Elizabeth here and here. They bring it in from all over. They're not there continue or constantly. But even they stopped going to find the merchandise from all over and all around. They stopped what they were doing and they got in. And so most of us have very recently done the gifted course. And can you still remember your top three giftings? Okay, so something like leadership and encouragement and teaching or the like. So that means that probably no one here has as their top three carrying heavy loads, clearing rubble, or stonemasonry. Now, the the interesting thing is that um, I very much doubt that it was the, the weekend hobby of the goldsmiths the perfume makers or the merchants to go and rebuild, to scratch through rubble, etc. But when the lights went on for them, when they realized, but wait a minute, this is their city. This is all about their safety. This is about their families. This is their walls. This is their future. Then they joined in. All of them. Verse 12 mentions a father with his daughters rebuilding. I'm assuming it mentions that because he didn't have sons. That's just an assumption, but it's, I think, a fairly logical assumption. And what I I love about this is that he didn't dial out because um, I don't have sons, so so I'm kind of disqualified. Now, with his daughters, he said, well, if we don't have sons, then you girls are going to help me, and we're going to rebuild the section in front of our house. And I'm sure that stirred other families. Other sons that were pre- would have preferred to play PlayStation thought, well, if the girls can do it, then we better get off our uh, PlayStation 
but and go and help dad. And the families were stirred, and they got going. The, to me, this, this speaks of nobody being disqualified, but also it speaks that fathers, you are incredible catalysts. If you're a father, just, just press your finger into your own thigh quickly, just so that you know I'm talking about you, you, it's me, I'm me. You fathers, you are an incredible catalyst to qualify or to disqualify people, starting with our family and our children. I love it that the, the perfume makers, I don't know why, but it's always, I always kind of read that with a bit of a smile. The perfume makers. I'm sure they were mainly men. Um, it was good to smell good while you're building the wall. I'm sure your neighbor appreciated it at least. But what I love it is the perfume makers didn't say, well, our hands are too soft to carry these stones. And, and the rest of the people didn't look down on whoever else. You didn't quickly find, you didn't suddenly find somebody looking at one of the goldsmiths saying, hmm, from gold to stone, that's a bit of a step down. You know, everyone was in this together. Everyone got stuck in. And as they got stuck in, the job got done. And it caused faith and courage and camaraderie to stir within them. Everyone got involved. Everyone followed. It reminded me of Deborah, Ch Judges chapter 5, verse 2. Deborah's song, it says, when the princes in Israel, in other words, the leaders, take the lead, and when the people willingly offer themselves, give themselves, praise the Lord. She's saying, when the leaders lead and when the people follow, praise the Yeraman. When the people, when the leaders do what they're supposed to do, when they lead in a godly way and when the people follow wholeheartedly, Praise God, that's, that's how, what he intended. That's why he gave leaders to lead, and that's why he gave people to follow. And so when it actually happens, it doesn't sound like rocket science, but it's, somehow it doesn't always happen. But when it does happen, praise the Lord. The leaders lead, the people follow. Hallelujah. It's exactly what's happening here. The leaders led, and the people started to follow wholeheartedly. And immediately, there was great progress there was real, visible change within days. Literally within days. If you read the chapter, 10 times over it, it mentions the rulers of this grouping, the ruler of that grouping. This guy, the ruler of that section, actually mentions, as I said, 10 different rulers. So to me, that's, in our context, the, the leaders, the, the life group leaders, the mercy ministry leaders, the uh, band leaders, the, the worship, the children's church leaders, the leaders leading, the, the rulers ruling. So fathers, lead your households well. Rulers or leaders, lead your people well. And for us as the people, let us give ourselves willingly. Likewise, we are, we are called to be part of this great adventure. Whatever our age, whatever our gifting, whatever our preference, we are also called to build into this great future that lies ahead of us. Build into, even if we speak physically, this new venue that's going to lie two kilometers further from you or maybe two kilometers closer to you, building into this which God has prepared for us. There is a great prophetic future waiting for us as a people. Since Adam, just think about it, since Adam, that land has been laying fallow, I think that's the word. It's never been developed. It's never been built on until now. Until this generation. 
until we are called and stirred to develop, to build on, to stand tall, representing God and His people for future generations to open up an incredible door, an incredible gate into the kingdom of heaven. Third aspect, where do we start? The Israelites might, must have, or the remnant, must have looked around at the mess that they were living in. But where do we start? It's a, it's a fair question, especially with such a, an incredibly vast span of work. And interestingly enough, once again, when we read the chapter, the answer seemed to be so simple. But it says the following. He made repairs opposite his house. They made repairs in front of their home. They repaired the section beside their house, opposite his living quarters. So rebuilding starts at home, right in front of them, right in front of us, right beside them, beside us, opposite them, opposite us, around them, opposite, around us. The, the stones, so just put yourself in the picture here, or in the locality, the, the stones around them, the heaps of rubble that they were avoiding, that they were walking around, literally probably stumbling over, these very physical reminders, daily reminders of defeat became the very building blocks of their future. Is that not incredible? The reminders of defeat became the building blocks of defense. A scorched past became what they used for a promise-filled future. Think of your past. Think of your moments of a scorched past. And see how you can rebuild that, build that into a wall of a promised full future. You remember, if you think back, that at one stage when Nehemiah was taking stock, while he was checking out the work that needed to be done, he said at some stage he came to a place where his mount could not go any further because of the rubble. And so he turned around. His path, his progress was blocked by the rubble, not even by an enemy. There was no enemy at that stage. But their progress was simply blocked by the rubble to such an extent that even being mounted, he could not get past. Fathers, lead your households. Households, we as households, we need to start dealing with the rubble around us, in front of us, beside us, right there in our faces as reminders of our own defeat, our own failure, our own opposition, and the circumstances that we are living in. Your struggles, your difficulties, your circumstances, your crisis provide you with an opportunity, an opportunity to address that and to build it back into a wall of overcoming, of breakthrough, of becoming like the one who has called you by grace. The very things that are lying all around you, stopping yourself in your tracks like it did Nehemiah, these are the things that we need to use to build the future. Question is, where do we start rebuilding? The thing is, we, we cannot build the new while we are still living in the current, while we are still living surrounded by the rubble strewn all around us. We first have to deal with these smoldering bricks, these smoldering stones. In Nehemiah chapter 4, the, the next chapter, it starts to deal with, 
opposition. Opposition starts to flare up from the outside. And uh, we, we see a man named Sanballat. And he causes opposition and mocking and ridicule. And in chapter 4, verse 2, he asks, obviously, a rhetorical question, but it's more a statement as he shouts it over them. He says to them, will they finish in a day? Can they bring these stones back to life from these heaps of rubble, burnt as they are? And so the question, can these stones live again? Can they be useful again? The question to ourselves, when we face ourselves, when we lie in bed tonight is, can I be useful again? Can every area of my life be fanned into flame again? Can, can, can this smoldering stone be brought to life again? Can my marriage work again? Can my business flourish again? Will my children serve God again? Will my health improve again? And so, St. Ballot asks, will it happen in a day? It can. It did for some. If you think of the Old Testament, think of someone like Joseph, how his life completely turned around in a day. Joseph woke up in prison. He went to bed that evening. His prime minister, married to a princess, living in a palace. It's quite a day. It happened in a day for Mordecai and the nation of Israel back in the book of Esther. It happened in a day in a number of examples. I don't want to go into that. But the New Testament, when Jesus walked in the earth, it it happened in a day for so many more. Just thinking of of one or two. In a day, the life of a shortish tax collector, Zacchaeus, in a day, his life changed completely. Can it happen in a day? Ask Saul of Tarsus. Can your life change in a day? But it doesn't always happen immediately. It doesn't always happen instantaneously. It doesn't always happen after one quick prayer. It doesn't always happen in a day. Sometimes it requires more fast bait, more tenacity, more determination, being faithful in discipline. But life can come again. Life can always come again. And so I want to besiege you to to please deal with the rubble around you. It's almost like having a garage sale. Deal with the rubble around you. Deal with your own emotions that is sometimes so tied to your circumstances, tied to the weather. It sounds terrible. You know, but sometimes my emotions is is tied to the weather. I plan this thing for the weekend. It's going to be this incredible picnic down at the Hoed Boom. And then it rains. And my emotions is tied to the weather. So let's stop it. (laughs) Stop allowing our emotions to be tied to our circumstances, to the weather, to the financial markets. Jesus is still on the throne. Lift our eyes on high to see eternally again. But when you read as you've done, when you read this chapter, chapter 3, the most in-your-face aspect of it, the most repeated aspect of it is the phrase, this, next to him, next to them, the next section, the adjoining section. It's mentioned more than 30 times 
in a chapter of 32 verses. That's a high percentage. Next to, next to, next to. It speaks of great unity, of being linked in, of being part of something, of being united. But it also speaks of not having offenses, not having issues, not having stuff. Just think for a moment. If your neighbor comes walking around you and suggests that that you need to build a wall in front of you, are you in a place that that you are happy to to co-labor with your physical neighbor at the moment? Or are you still the dingus and because his dog ate your rose bushes and he's muffed because your cat is dingusing on his porch? You know, this is real. This is neighbors. But yet they are linked in. There's no offenses. There's no issues. It's next to, next to, next to, next to. So just the amazing thing is, if somebody will, if someone, that neighbor of yours, is building next to you, and in the end, you get into that place where you're teething in, and it becomes one wall, it means that there's no gaps. But the problem is, if there is no one next to you, there's a gap next to you. And a gap in the wall is as good as no wall. A gap in the wall is as good as no wall. I go for a walk most mornings, and I walk past some homes with great walls and no gates. And it always amuses me. What's the point? Okay, let's move on. A gap in the wall is as good as having no wall at all. So who are you building next to in life and in liberty? Who are you coming alongside on your journey? Remember at one stage, and irrelevant, but remember asking the question, why is your domestic better off because she's working for you? Why is your gardener better off because he's working for you and not for the neighbor? Why is your neighbor better off because he's living, he's staying next to you? Who are you coming alongside to on this journey? Who are you encouraging to get up and to build the adjoining section? Who are you drawing in with with your enthusiasm, your excitement, your involvement, your ownership of this incredible challenge that's awaiting us as a people in the next season? You see, the shocking thing is we are either next to, alongside, or adjoined in heart and in spirit, or we are the ones leaving, even causing the gaps in the wall, the gaps for the enemy to enter in. I want to come back to that question of Sanballat. Stick to the notes, but San Bala, doesn't that? <laughs> it's such a funny name. Who has seen the gods must be crazy? Way back. Can you remember the, the name of, of the lead of the rebels? It was something similar to San Balat. It was San Boja. Well, in any event, I just. San Balat or San Boja? So Sanballat says, can these stones live again? Can they bring these stones back to life from the heaps of rubble burnt as they are? Can they come back to life? 1 Peter 2, verse 4 to 6, 2, 4, 6. Reads as follows, as you come to Jesus, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God as precious to him. Rejected by God, chosen, rejected by men, chosen by God as precious to him. You also, like living stones, you also 
possibly rejected by men, but chosen by God, precious to him, like a living stone, are being built into a spiritual house. You are part of a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For the scripture says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. If this is the only thing you take from this morning, but I hope there's more, is that if you put your trust in him, the precious chosen cornerstone, rejected by some, accepted by God, precious to him, if you put your trust, your hope, your faith, your future, your eternity in him, you will not be disappointed. You will not be put to shame. Remember Sanballat's question. Can these stones live again? And I think for many of us, probably for all of us, immediately some other portion of Scripture comes to mind. Can these bones live again? And so I am going to go to Ezekiel 37. I am closing with this, and I will be in time. Ezekiel 37 the hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and he set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them and I saw a great many bones on the floor of this valley. valley. Bones that were very dry. He's making a point here. And then he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? Very wisely he answered, oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. And then he said to me, prophesy, speak life into these bones, into these slain ones. Say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to the bones. I will make breath into you, and I will make you come to life. I will attach, attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you, and I will cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. And then you will know that I am the Lord. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So he got up and he prophesied. I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound as the bones came together. I looked and tendons came upon them and I watched as flesh covered them and skin covered them, but there was still no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. And so I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath entered them, and they came to life, and they stood on their feet, a vast army. Can you bring back to life the stones, the rubble in your life? The heaps of rubble that you've become accustomed to, that you avoid, that you look away from, that you walk the other way around them. Can, you, can those heaps of rubble come back to life? The marriage, the business, the family, the health, the finances, the future, the doubt. I want to ask, if you won't join me this morning in a prophetic action, I'm going to ask that we all stand, those who want to. And this morning as we face... This question, I'd, I'd actually like you to find some space. Move, uh, yeah, let me, let me tell you because I don't want anybody to do something that you're not comfortable with. I really feel that it's time for us to prophesy, 
to speak life over the stones and the rubble around you. Not far off, right in front of you, that which faces you, that which you face daily, that which you see and reminds you of defeat. The very circumstances around you. I want you to prophesy and to speak life into that which is relevant to you. I want you to do it boldly with gusto. So find a place where no one can hear you. And we are going to play a song, an incredible song called Rattle. And it speaks about Ezekiel 37. It speaks about bone coming to bone. And so we're going to play that loudly so that no one will hear which stones you are speaking into, what issues you're speaking into, what you are prophesying into, what you are speaking life into. Can we hit that song? And can we speak life into the bones around us?